one day Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Yevarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha Yair Adonai pana v'lecha v'yichuneka Yisa Adonai pana v'lecha v'yasem lecha shalom The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And good afternoon, happy Sunday, everybody, and welcome to the NTEB House Church Sunday Service. My name is Pastor Jeff Greider, and uh, we'd like to welcome you to our worship time today. There is a cup of God and the cup of devils. Which one will you be drinking from? One of the recurring themes that we see in the Bible is the cup of God. And it follows through from the Old Testament to the New Testament and right up until the end of the book of Revelation. In the Gospels, Jesus was teaching his disciples about things related to his death, burial, and resurrection, as well as to what it means to be a true minister of God. Jesus asked them if they could drink from the same cup that he was about to drink from. I think that's a really good question. And Uh, It's one that we would do well to consider. Mark chapter 10, verse 38. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? In the church age that would follow the Gospels, Saul was on the road to Damascus one day looking for more Christians to kill when he met the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Many things would take place during that encounter, and it would result with Saul taking a good, long drink at the cup of God. When I look around at the professing Christian church in our day, I do not see the cup of God. I see a self-centered, self-focused, and lukewarm form of Christianity that lines up perfectly with the falling away Paul prophesies about. On this Sunday service, let's reacquaint ourselves with the biblical cup of God that presents itself in two ways. It's a cup of service, and it's a cup of judgment. The first cup is what everybody who will follow after Jesus will drink from. And the second cup is, well, for everybody who rejects the first cup. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for waking us up today and putting food on the table and clothes on our back and a roof over our head and um, we thank you God and we praise you and uh, Lord it's a beautiful sunshiny day here in Florida and um, we're just we're just so glad to be saved and serving and looking for that blessed hope and Titus 2 13 says uh, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you wanted to come and get us today, Lord, we would be very happy with that. We would be fine with that. Uh, This world holds nothing for us, Lord, uh, that we want to hang on to. And uh, while you keep us here, we just pray, Lord, that you would allow us to get something done for you in these last days, these closing moments of the church age. And uh, we just thank you and praise you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, um, welcome, everybody. Glad that you're here today. Uh, We have people in the studio listening live. Uh, Lorianne is here, of course, and uh, Linda and Joe LaPiana are sitting here. 
And, uh, you know, our studio is always open. If you want to come listen to these services live, uh, you are more than welcome to do so. We'll even give you a cup of coffee uh, and the right hand of fellowship, as the Bible says. Um, We are excited. It is less than a month away. It is less than a month away to the third annual NTEB uh, Old Fashioned Camp Meeting. And uh, we are so excited. We have been literally preparing for the last um, six or seven months. If you could see the amount of work and preparation that goes into a camp meeting, I think you would be astounded. And it takes an entire team of people to do this. And uh, one of the things that the Lord has blessed us with here is a great group of people who really uh, very talented people on every level. We have artists and social media people and web content creation people and uh, administrative people and um, uh, bookstore people. And it takes everybody to pull off the camp meeting. And it's good that we have a big team of people because this camp meeting is going to be the most ambitious one that we have had so far. And if you can't make it, please pray um, for everybody to have traveling mercies and um, for the preaching and teaching to to go off unhindered. Uh, but if you can make it, you're going to get to hear preaching from, well, from myself, of course, uh, Pastor Joel Tillis, Pastor Dave Struble, and uh, Dr. Bill Grady. And uh, we are so excited about that. And uh, we have spent months and months and months working on the camp meeting songbook. And I just put a picture into the chat room. I'm just going to tease you with um, the front cover and a little bit of the table of contents. But there it is. It is it is printed and um, it is going to make a beautiful keepsake. And um, uh, it just... It came out better than I imagined that it would be. Uh, So please pray for the camp meeting and everybody who's going to preach and teach and everybody who's going to minister and the people who are going to cook the food, uh, just everything. And our camp meeting weekend starts Friday, May 19th, and uh, it's going to take place at the bookstore, and we're going to do a live taping of the soul trap with pastor joel tillis and then of course saturday is the actual camp meeting day and um, then sunday we're going to do like we always do we're going to go out into the highways and byways and compel them to come in and then we're going to have a nice little fellowship lunch after that so if you can make it um, we actually still it's not a hundred percent sold out but we're right around 175 people um, who will be attending the camp meeting. It will be the largest one that we've ever had. And um, if you can make it, we would love to see you here. And I'm going to put a link into the chat room. Um, so it's completely free. It doesn't cost anything, but you, we... Uh, We do need you to register so we know approximately how many people will be coming. So um, you can go to nowtheendbegins.com and the registration link is about halfway down the homepage. If you're just tuning in, you've reached the NTEB House Church Sunday service. Today we're going to be talking about the cup of God. And God has a cup. And the devil has a cup. And we're going to be looking at both those cups today. And we're going to compare them and contrast them. You know, in Deuteronomy 32, verses 31 through 34, the Bible says this. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are the grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their, their wine is the poison of dragons. And the cruel venom of asps. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? 
And then 1 Corinthians 10.21 says, Ye cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. And today we're going to look at, well, both those cups. But the main one that we're going to be focusing on is the cup of the Lord. So glad that you've decided and chosen to worship with us here today.
Undertaker, 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 won't you please drive slow? For that lady, you are hauling, Lord, I hate to see her go. Will the circle be unbroken by Amen, amen. The Bible says there is a better home, and it is awaiting. And you know what? We're going to go up into the sky to get it. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, starting in verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You know what the wisest man that ever lived said about life and death? Take a look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and uh, I'm going to give you a big chunk of this. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and we're going to go all the way down to verse 8. Solomon says, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them, while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, And the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease, because they are few. And those that look out the windows be darkened. And the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low. And he shall rise up at the voice of the bird, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Also when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fears shall be in the way. And the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden. And desires shall fail, because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. Or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. You know, that word vanity means nothingness. And you know what Solomon, what conclusion that the wisest man that ever lived, the conclusion that he came to after having uh, incalculable riches, unparalleled wisdom, he had over a thousand wives He had anything that his heart desired. And when he came to the end of his life, he said, all of that stuff, just a big pile of nothing. The Apostle Paul gives a little bit of an update on that. The Apostle Paul says this in Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 7. Paul says, but what things were gained to me, prestige, honor, position, money, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. You know what Paul was saying? Paul was saying 
that the best that this world has to offer, and today in my message, we're going to talk about the cup of the world, and I'm going to show you what that cup is filled with. And Paul said that all these things that he lost in order to follow Jesus Christ, he said, I do count them but crap. That's what Paul said. I count them the way that you would look at human excrement, that you flush down the toilet. You know what Paul was talking about? He was talking about his 401k. He was talking about sending his kids off to college. He was talking about having that retirement home by the lake. He was talking about this and that and everything that we concern ourselves with on a daily basis that has nothing to do with God. And Paul said, all this stuff that I had to give up is nothing but a big pile of crap that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness, which is of God by faith. And now why? Why would Paul do all of this stuff? You know, Paul said that he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was trained at the feet of Gamaliel. He had money. He had a nice house to live in. He had everything that the the world of that time could offer in the way of creature comforts. And Paul said, you know, I had to give up all that stuff to follow Jesus Christ. It's nothing but a big bunch of crap. And the reason why... I am happy that I did that. Look at Philippians 3.10. That I may know him. That I may know him. And the power of his resurrection. You know what the power of his resurrection does? It raises you from the dead. You may not think much about that now. And that's what Solomon was talking about in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Solomon was saying, you're not thinking much about it now. The evil days have not arrived and you're young, you're strong. You have everything that the world has to offer. But the day's going to come where that bowl's going to be broken and the silver cord's going to be loosed. And away you go. The question is, which way are you going to go? Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. You know what Paul was talking about? He was talking about the Christian life. Do you know why when you look around the Christian church today, you don't see that? Because they're not, they're not Christians. You can become saved. You can become born again. That does not make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is following after Jesus Christ. And Paul said in the last days there was going to be a great falling away. Nobody was going to be preaching doctrine. There was going to be a famine of Bible doctrine. And that's the day that we have arrived at. But Ecclesiastes 8.4 says, Where the word of a king is, there is power. And we have that word today, and we stand on that word today. And that is the word that we bring you today. As we sit here, um, April 23rd of 2023, on the cusp of the blessed hope of the rapture of the church. Are you ready to fly? I sure am. Glad you're here today. I'm kind of homesick for a country to which I've
time won't matter anymore. You love, I'm longing for you, and the sun. one of my favorite, favorite songs of all time and one of the very first Christian songs I ever listened to after I got saved 32 years ago. Uh, In just a minute, one more song and we're going to go into our prayer time. If you have a, a prayer request or a praise report, please post that in the chat room and uh, we will lift that up before the Lord. And if you're listening Uh, From time to time, people will tell me, I can't find the chat room. Well, thousands of people find the chat room every single month. It's not hard to do, but if you really can't find it, just go to ntebradio.com. That's ntebradio.com, and you will be in the chat room. Uh, One more song, and we're going to go to the Lord in prayer.
Heavenly Father, we come before you in prayer this morning, and um, Lord, uh, it's just such an, an honor and a privilege to be able to lift these prayers up to you. You know, I think the worst thing about hell, the very worst thing about hell, and I don't think it's the flames, because after you've been burned to death for a minute, you know, being burnt for an hour or a month or a year, it's really not going to make much of a difference at that point. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I think the flames of hell are literal and they're real and they're terrible, but I don't think that's the worst part about hell. I think the worst part about hell is that people are crying out and nobody's listening. I just can't imagine what that would be like to have no hope of any kind. To scream at the top of your lungs and no one is listening. So, Heavenly Father, oh, we thank you, we praise you that we can come boldly before the throne of grace and cry, Abba, Father. The Apostle Paul says, be careful for nothing in Philippians 4, 6. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. People say to me all the time, I have no peace, I have no peace. I say, how much do you pray? Paul says there is a direct correlation between the peace that you have and the prayers that you put up. And uh, it is an honor and it is a privilege that we get to pray. And it's astounding that not just somebody is listening. I mean, that would be good if somebody was listening. But to know that the God of all creation is listening. And not only is he listening, he is ready and able and eager to answer those prayers. It says in the Gospels, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father in heaven give unto those that love him? So, Father, we come before you today. Jane is asking salvation prayers for son Troy. Julie Lynn is praying for Katie Ann to get saved. Chona is praying for Estefano Jr., Eugenia, her kids. Marisol and Cherry and Chona's siblings, Julia and Maria Tricia. 
Chuck Edgerton would like prayers for his son Jacob and his mom Lynette for salvation. <coughs> Samantha is praying salvation for Beth. Deborah Hare is praying for her unsaved family members. Rita is praying for unsaved Catholic family members. Teresa is praying for family members. Lisa is praying for her father, John. Annabal is, um, he's asking salvation prayer for his unsaved kids. And Deborah Milton is praying for her unsaved son, Billy. Uh, people who need a healing today. I was talking with Kyle Gorzell earlier, and Kyle says um, about uh, Uncle David, no new updates, has good days and bad days, but overall doing okay. And so we continue to pray for Kyle's Uncle David. Annetta had a stroke last year, and um, she has she's come a long way. But she still can't fully walk on her own. And we pray that God would continue to give her a healing, especially on the left side of her body. Robert Wiley is battling ALS disease, and he needs prayer. <coughs> Rob Beatty, he has good days and bad days, but we continue to pray for him. Last week, he went into hospice, and four days later, he came out. And he's feeling well enough. He went back to his house. Um, I don't know what God is doing with Rob Beatty, but he's doing something. Please continue to pray for Rob Beatty as he battles cancer. Clayton Perry, um, he's battling cancer. He's been battling it for almost three years. Um, and we're still praying for him. Craig Arford is having uh, pancreatic cancer surgery on the 26th that I believe is Tuesday Aaron Riddle's sister Tracy has metastatic breast cancer Shira Shine um, she said that she saw her oncologist today and she's not quite sure how it's going to go but she said I was having a pity party but then I realized sitting in that cancer center again the opportunity that I had to glorify God and I witnessed to a nurse and a patient. That is the right way to look at it. And she says, please continue to pray for me and for my children, Nicole, Sherry, and Scott. Maddie Luck has been diagnosed with Luli body dementia. Jill Puckett needs prayer because she's losing her vision. Rebecca Lynn, her friend Joel Smith, is recovering from a stroke, but he's still not saved. Linda praying for Hannah's mom, who got blood clots. Natalie and husband Ken both need prayers for health issues. Patricia Alliston is uh, pr asking prayer for her husband, Ron, who has cancer. Sharon Hansen needs a healing from dementia. Uh, Rita, she says, um, oh, the surgery is on the 25th. But that's Tuesday. Okay. Uh, please pray for Craig Arford. <coughs> uh, Gary says, my friend Carrick from Pennsylvania diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And uh, please continue to pray. Paul Caulfield has type 1 sugar diabetes. Annabelle Ortiz, my wife Vilma, having cervical fusion surgery on Wednesday. Please pray. We will. We are. Sarah Riddle's husband, Randy, hip replacement uh, last week. And I'm just going to take that off the list. Um, and Sarah, if you're listening, if you could give us an update on that. Uh, Curtis Schmidt. I have AFib and congestive heart failure. I am close to going home to be with Jesus. And uh, we're praying that God gives him a testimony. Um, Annette. My best friend's daughter, who is a drug addict on the prayer list, she went to a rehab ranch, but she relapsed. And uh, we are praying for her um, to get clean, sober, and saved. Very little point in getting clean and sober if you don't get saved. Uh, Jeanette says, my mom has another lump in her breast. Uh, please pray that this is not cancer. It's pretty big. 
Tests are being scheduled, and we are absolutely praying. Uh, Ladies who are expecting Trisha's daughter, Elena Blackburn, my daughter, Kelsey Emerson, uh, Aaron Riddle, Gary Tatterson's daughter, Kayla, Linda and Joe LaPiana's son and daughter-in-law, April would like prayers for her niece, Terry Bryant's daughter, Jillian, and Heather's daughter is pregnant. And Heather's daughter is not saved, so that's a double prayer there as well. And um, speaking of Terry Bryant, we forgot to wish her a happy birthday on the podcast on Friday. Well, we, I forgot. Um, so forgive me for that, but we, will, we are wishing Terry a very happy birthday. Uh, Mark Saxa, please pray for my son Joseph to return to the Lord. And uh, I have put my son Calvin back on the prayer list for much for the, of the same thing that Mark Saxa is asking prayer for. So please pray for my son Calvin. Aunt Nancy, uh, please pray for Brandon and Michelle to get saved. Leslie, oh, well, she has a number of things that she needs the Lord to work on. So we're just going to bundle that all up into a big, fat, unspoken prayer. And um, please remember Leslie in your prayers. The Lord knows the need. Palmetto State Guy would like prayer for his mother Eunice and for his father Paul for health issues. Diane would like prayers for her grandchildren. Uh, Connor is 17. Victoria is 14. And they have begun to flirt with the transgender deception. I can't imagine what that would be like if one of my kids were to go through that. Um, I honestly don't know what I would do. I mean, if it's your kid, what do you do? But I know what I wouldn't do. I wouldn't compromise the gospel. I wouldn't say, well, since it's my kid now, then it's it's not as bad. It is bad. It's terrible. Um, and the only thing, it's like, what do you do? Diane wants her grandchildren to get back on the straight and narrow path. But what do you tell them? I think that would require, if it was me, I don't I I would just get on my face before the Lord and just say Lord just do something. I wouldn't even know what to ask for. But I know what I wouldn't do. I wouldn't compromise the gospel. Rebecca D, please pray for uh my daughter Tamaya, Leah and for me. Ramona Hayes praying for her daughter Kimberly who is fighting the demon of alcohol. And uh, that's one of the things that we're going to talk about today. Also, um, she has unsaved grandchildren, William Potter, Jason Taylor, David Taylor, Amanda Odell, and their families. Sandra Carbonera praying for Vince. He's a young man with depression, cutting, and suicidal thoughts. Um, The Hoffer clan up in Canada, we're praying for them, that God would um, set them on fire to get something done for him, which they pretty much are. And it's exciting to see what they're doing up there. Uh, Christy, she wants her ex-husband who has been jailed to be held accountable for his actions. And um, uh, her husband, Adam, uh, he got the job. Okay, this is a praise report. Amen. And they're going to be moving to Texas next week. So uh, we pray for traveling mercies and we rejoice with you on the new job. Uh, Christy was Jeanette's weekend caregiver. Now Jeanette needs a new weekend caregiver. Joni would like salvation prayers for Ashley, Clint, Ember, Knox, Lucas, Brian, Mary, and Dee. Kevin Thompson, please pray for my father-in-law's salvation, Tim Thompson. He often weighs heavy on my mind and heart. Amen. Uh, And Kevin says, a customer that I deliver to has heart and lung issues. Uh, He is saved, but not walking with the Lord. Please pray for God to work in his life. Amen. Todd Dabuki. um, I I spoke with him on Friday and... um, He told me an incredible story 
of he got hit with a DWI and he's in Texas and he's going to jail for seven years. And I really, I told him that that is outstandingly harsh. I have never heard of anybody ever going to jail for seven years for a DWI. Um, so I, I really don't know what to pray for, for Todd, but I told him that we would put him on the list, but the Lord knows. And, uh, this is why, Hey, when you come to now, the end begins, you're not getting complicated praying. You're not getting flowery words. The prayers that we pray here, nobody ever is going to put them in a book and say, wow, these are the beautiful prayers of now the end begins because we don't pray like that. <clears throat> we pray direct and to the point. We put it at the feet of God and say, Lord, you know what to do. And we ask you that you do it for your glory and for our good. I don't know of any other way to pray. Um, Brett Kruger. Brett Kruger's mom, um, passed away over the weekend she was saved she's in heaven um but it's hard it's sad and uh dina contacted me the other day um dina's husband is brett kruger and uh, uh, uh it's just it's just hard it's just sad you know you know where she is um but you miss her so please pray for the Kruger family, for Dina and Brett, and for the children and the brothers and sisters, and just everybody in the Kruger family. Paul and Peggy Caulfield would like continued prayers for a Christian girl in high school who was being pressured by the school to change her gender. Um, they asked that she would be left on the prayer list indefinitely. Amen. Unspoken prayer requests. The LaPiana family. Jeanette Marie C., Adrian P. Breda, Chris Hart, Kate, John Bayor, Steve, Haley and Dan, and Dr. Shirley. Um, let's go to the, the uh, chat room list from this morning. Julia says, good morning from the Philippines. Uh, please pray for Mary Alia Obispo and her family that they m might be saved. And for me and for everyone that God may continuously give us strength in the struggles of this world. Amen. Anna Galvez. I have had a headache for days, uh, maybe because of the weather here in the Philippines, very hot. Just taking my maintenance blood pressure medicines. Uh, please uh, praise the Lord that I can take it. And she says to the fight. Amen. And then she also says, um, Sharon Deganis is in the hospital on a ventilator. And this is the first time that I'm hearing about this. If anybody can give me any more information about why Sharon is in the hospital on a ventilator, um, please let me know. Um, m, m says, praise report. I received this from Tim Kelly regarding his tracheotomy removal. Uh, he says, a few weeks ago, I had surgery to repair my airway. Uh, the surgery went as planned, and I am recovering well. I am optimistic. And for the first time since the accident, I can see a reachable finish line for recovery. It is truly a miracle. Praise God. And we've been praying for Tim Kelly for quite some time now. And he says... <coughs> On behalf of me and my family, we can't thank you enough for the prayers, support, and recovery wishes. The response from everybody has been humbling. We are so grateful, and you are welcome. We're very happy to do it. Uh, Jeanette says, I need a new weekend caregiver. Uh, the one that I have is moving to Texas to be with her mom and pray for her mom. She has pancreatic cancer. Agar says, um, prayers for tomorrow, two job interviews. And we will pray for that. Kenny B says, please pray for Ellie's friend, Anna. Thankfully, she's out of the hospital and did not need surgery. 
so please lift her up for a speedy healing. Grace said I had the chance to witness to my garbage man and asked him if he was a Christian. His reply was he grew up in a home that didn't talk about God. I replied, so so did I. And when I was 12, a pastor gave me a Bible and told me to learn John 3.16. I did and called upon the Lord, so can you if you believe. He replied, yes, I do. Pray for him and for me to see him again. Amen. Um, Pray for Charlton. Uh, Charlton has been very prayerfully seeking the Lord's will in his life. And he has launched a street ministry uh, where he lives. And I'm just putting a picture into the chat room that he sent to me this morning. And uh, he's just going out to the corner, just being a fool for the Lord. And um, he has that King James Bible, some gospel tracts, and he's just doing the best that he can to be a witness. And so many people here at Now the End Begins are handing out Bibles and handing out tracts and getting on fire for the Lord. And um, that, that really, really uh, makes me happy and it encourages me. Uh, Jer- but pray for Charlton and his ministry, just like Jill handing out all those Bibles. Uh, and Kyle Gorzell and Kentucky Jeffrey. Jericho Daly says he's praying for me and for my throat to be made whole. I will say amen to that. Thank you. Angel, uh, please pray for the unsaved Catholic family members of NTEB. Julius, uh, praise report. Maria Alia Obispo um, accepted with no hesitation the gospel tract that I gave to her. Hopefully it is the start for her and her family to get saved. Amen. Andrew said, prayers for all unsaved family, friends, and neighbors. Uh, Enoch says, please pray for my sister Morgan to work out her salvation. I have sent her a Bible and talked to her and made her a whole website. But I need God to knock on her door. And that's right. Salvation is a supernatural act of God. People, they have to respond. God is not a Calvinist. But getting saved is a supernatural act of God. Uh, But the Bible does say that God is not willing that any should perish. All you have to do is respond to the conviction and you'll be saved. Uh, Sean V., Please pray for the salvation of unsaved family members. My father, Joseph, my mother, Sharon, my sisters, Roxanne and Brigitte, my son, Callum, and my nephew, Zachary and Xander. And also for a complete healing for Roxanne's mind um, and body from her pill addiction. And for my mother, Sharon, who has fallen in the night multiple times recently. Um, Sean got saved here a couple of months ago. And now he's on fire getting something done with his family. And we are happy to lift up his family members. Uh, His grace says, um, need prayer for my wife, Betsy's dear friend, Kathy, who has unsolved internal health issues. And we're working on her faith as well. CJ, please pray for my friend, Trisha, who I witnessed to. Also, Doreen, who listened to me. She's a Mormon. Um, And my brother and wife, who are Catholic, uh, and she says, Lord, please water these seeds according to your will. Amen. Rachel, um, don't forget to pray for the lost souls who will be attending SatanCon. That's a convention having to do with Satan, and it just might be our podcast tomorrow. Uh, Jill says, praise report. I almost forgot I got a call after going to bed a couple of nights ago and it was my niece saying she wants to have faith like a child and knows that she needs God in her life. Been praying for her. Amen. Amen. Sounds like she's very close to getting saved. Julius, an unspoken request for me um, as well. um, Something work related that I might be able to survive until the day of Flight 777. Amen. Jill says, my niece's name is Emmy. Please pray for her this week. Uh, So please remember Jill's niece, Emmy, for salvation. She's very close, though. 
and we are looking to that praise report soon. Uh, Jericho says, I have an unspoken prayer request. And Erad, Bairu Mumishu. I can't tell you how many times in private I have practiced saying that last name. Erad says, uh, yesterday I enrolled for a one-month driving course. And after that, I will be given a driving license. Um, I am getting ready that when God gives me a car, I will take care of it. Please pray that God will go well and that God will fund my car fundraiser. And uh, many people here have contributed to that. Uh, If there's a link for his fundraiser, if somebody could please post it in the chat room. And um, we are very happy to support our brother and fellow missionary Erad. And... (coughs) And with that, we have this week's prayer list. It took 29 minutes to lift that up before the Lord. And that's the short list. If you want the full list, then you got to get on our email list and Jeanette will be happy to send it to you. Um, Just reach out to her in the chat room with your email address and she'll be happy to put you on the list. Um. But I tell you, prayer is the most important power that we have. It's the greatest blessing, the greatest privilege that a Christian can ever know. That the God of the universe, the God of the Bible, is hearing your prayer and answering it according to his will for you. What's better than that? Nothing is better than that. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you. We lift up all these prayers for healing. We lift up these prayers for restoration, for finances, for living situations, for jobs, for mothers and fathers, for sons and daughters and family relationships, work relationships, friend relationships, love relationships. Everything, Lord, that... We prayed about today. We ask you to work and move. Uh, Kenny B. is asking, can we post the full prayer list to Telegram? No, the, that is way too big. It is huge. Um, but you can get it uh, through your email. And Father God, we just thank you. We praise you. Lord, we have people battling serious things. Blindness, cancer, multiple sclerosis, Strokes, heart attacks, blood clots. But you're the great physician, God. Nothing is too hard for you. And so we come before you today and we're thankful for the praises. We're grateful for the prayers. And Lord, we just give it all to you. We put it at your feet and we say, thy will be done. And uh, Lord, if, if it's for your glory, it will absolutely be for our good. And Jeanette's saying, I do post the full prayer list. Well, you learn something new every day. Amen. Amen. And Father God, thank you, praise you. And we commit this, uh, the rest of this service to you, the preaching, as we open up the pages of your book, Lord, the King James Bible. And uh, we just ask you to work and move as only you can, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, one more song. I'm going to catch my breath, and we're going to come back for the message today. And I think we have a pretty good one. There is the cup of God and the cup of devils. Which cup will you be drinking from? Isn't that a great topic? I think it is. Glad that you're here today, and we're going to get started with our the rest of our service right after this. Step down in 
Amen. And with that, let's get started with the message today. If you're just tuning in, you have reached the NTEB House Church Sunday service. Today's message is entitled, There is the cup of God and the cup of devils. Which one will you be drinking from? Uh, Take your Bibles, please, and open them to Mark chapter 10. And today's message is going to be um, part preaching, part teaching. It's going to be kind of like a um, kind of like a Bible study. And uh, open your King James Bibles to Mark chapter ten, and let's take a look. Let's start in oh I don't know. Let's start in verse thirty-two. And we are going to go down to verse 41. Mark chapter 10, 32 through 41. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them. And they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered into the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. Amen. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, We would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand, in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, "Uh, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of? And be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, Sure, no problem. (laughs) They had no idea what they were saying. And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of. And with the baptism that I am baptized with all, shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for this time, for this day, for these prayers, for these praises, um, for the hundreds and hundreds of people that are listening live and for the thousands more that will listen in the archives. Lord, we pray today if there's one listening who is lost, who doesn't know you, as Savior, that something would be said and done to lead a lost soul to you. And for those of us that are saved, Lord, we pray that you would reignite um, that desire that we have inside you, our first love, to get something done for you that will make it through the judgment seat. And we commit this time to you and ask you to lead and guide in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Today, we are talking about the cup of God and the cup of devils. And, um, you know, when I, people ask me a lot of the time, where do you get your ideas for the sermons from? And and how do you settle upon the topics that you um, have for the Bible studies? And with little exception, the vast majority of the time, I get my sermon ideas just from my daily Bible reading and teaching. Uh, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to be in the car longer than 20 minutes, I don't listen to music. I listen to preaching. I listen to Bible teaching. And um, that because that's the only way, you know, God didn't bless me with like a crazy high IQ. I don't consider myself to be above average intelligence. I have never taken an IQ test. I know that my mother, she took a test and she was right around 152. My mother was very, very, very smart. 
um, smart enough to get saved on her deathbed. But as far as intelligence goes, my mother was a very, very smart person. I don't know how much of that um, made its way to my DNA, but I do know this. The more that I open up God's word, the more that I read it, the more that I study it, the more that I, I, I soak my eyes and my mind and my heart and my spirit and my soul with God's word, the more I understand of it, the more it makes sense to me. And um, that's where my sermon topics 99% of the time come from. And that's where I get the ideas for Bible study. Most of the time, sometimes people will say to me, hey, can we talk about this subject? And I'm like, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, but if you want to hear from God, there is no shortcut. There is no excuse. If you want to know the Bible, you got to read it. And you got to read it like you enjoy it. Not read it like, well, you know, I did my four chapters today. And sometimes people will tell it to me like, you know, I, I had kale for lunch and I even kept it down. Isn't that a blessing? And there's a lot of people that look at Bible study like that. It was really hard, brother, but I made it through three chapters today. Well, if you read three chapters, praise the Lord, um, but it, it, it shouldn't be hard. You should want to do it because that book from Genesis to Revelation, that's God's word. That's the mind of God on paper. And so the more that you read this book, the more it's going to make sense, the more you're going to understand, the more you're going to know. And when I was reading this morning, I said all that to say this in Mark chapter 10. You know, Jesus says in verse 34, talking about what's going to happen to him when he goes to the cross. And I found it astonishing that he says that they're going to mock him and scourge him and spit upon him and kill him. And the third day he's going to rise again. And then the very next verse, you have James and John saying, hey, as long as you're going to go through all this stuff and wind up in glory, how about doing something for us? And isn't it funny that so many times when we read the Bible, we're reading the Bible to see what we can get out of it for us rather than enjoying the revelation from God and just being glad to spend time in his presence. And um, that's exactly what's happening here with the apostles, with the disciples. James and John said, hey, we would love for you to let us sit on your right hand and your left hand because you got that glory coming and we're going to be there with you. And isn't that going to be good? So let's just start decorating the kingdom now. And look at what Jesus says in verse 38. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? You know what Jesus was saying? He says, Yeah, I'm going to be in my glory. And it's all going to work out unbelievably well but in order to get to that point I have to be crucified died buried and risen again on the third day according to the scriptures you know the Bible says that we were um, in Romans uh, 6 3 know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Turn to John chapter 21. Turn to the gospel of John chapter 21. And here we have Jesus after his resurrection. 
And it happens to be the day that Peter is going to get ordained and he's going to be put into the ministry. John 21, verse 15, So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest me thou me more than these? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith unto him the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? He's reminding him of his trifold rejection of Jesus Christ. I know not the man. And he denied him three times. So, when he is being restored and ordained into the ministry, he has to be restored three times. And Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. I've always pictured Peter looking down at his feet and his face turning red and maybe looking away into the clouds. That must have been a really, really hard day for Peter after denying the Lord three times. And now Jesus is lovingly, but firmly restoring him. And he said unto him, feed my sheep. And now from this point on, all the way to the end of Acts chapter 7, Peter is going to be the main leader of the church. It's going to be an all-Jewish church. And he's going to be the main leader of the church all the way to the end of Acts chapter 7. And look at what Jesus says to Peter in John 21, 18. Remember, we started with Jesus saying, can you be baptized into the baptism that I am going to be baptized into? Can you drink from the cup that I am going to drink from? And what did they say back in Mark chapter 10? Sure, no problem. Piece of cake. We can be baptized. How hard is it to be baptized? You want us to drink from a cup? Well, how hard can that be? We can do it, no problem. John twenty one eighteen. This is where Jesus hands Peter his cup. And this is what Peter has to drink. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou was young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. This is the cup of the baptism of Jesus Christ. This is the cup that Jesus was talking about in Mark chapter 10. Turn to Mark chapter 14. Turn to Mark chapter 14. And let's look at verses um, 34 through 36. Mark chapter 14, 34 through 36. And he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take this cup from me. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. In Mark chapter 10, when Jesus was talking about, can you drink from the cup that I'm going to drink from? Can you be baptized in the baptism that I have to be baptized with? And they said, sure, no problem. We can do it, Lord. 
but they didn't know what they were saying yes to. And that's one of the differences between us and them. When you read Mark chapter 10 and you read Mark chapter 14, you know how the story ends up. You know that when Jesus says, can you drink of my cup? You know the cup that Jesus is talking about. That is a cup um, that I call the first cup that we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the cup of obedience. And when Jesus is talking to his disciples in Mark chapter 10, he says, that's right. You are going to be baptized into my baptism and you are going to drink from this cup. But you have no idea now what that's going to mean. And for every single apostle, except for Judas, who was the betrayer, and he dies, um, Acts one twenty five, and he goes to his own place. And with the exception of him and the apostle John, all the other apostles would be put to death for their faith. Uh, we read, I think it's in Acts chapter 12. Let me see if... Um, uh, Acts chat, yeah, Acts chapter 12, verse 1. Now, about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. There it is. Acts 12, 2. Didn't take all that long for James to get his cup. Remember back in Mark chapter 10? Who was it that said to Jesus, hey, can we sit on your left and right hand side? It was James and John. James doesn't make it past Acts chapter 12. And that's where he gets his cup. What was in that cup? That was the cup of obedience. Turn to Acts chapter 5. Turn to Acts chapter 5. And look down at the bottom, verses 40 through 42. Here we have Peter, James, and John. They're brought up in front of the council for the second time. They're preaching and teaching the Lord Jesus Christ. And the council doesn't like it. So they warned him the first time. They brought him back the second time. And then this is what happens. Uh, Acts 540 And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to preach and teach Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what got James killed Seven short chapters after Acts chapter 5. Are you starting to see in Mark chapter 10 when Jesus said, Hey, I have a cup. Can you drink from it? Sure we can, Lord. We love you. We'll be happy to do it. Yep, you're, you're going to drink from that cup all right. And you're going to be baptized into my baptism. But it's not what you think it is. And so the first cup that we're talking about today is the cup of obedience. And that is what Jesus demonstrated in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but thine be done. The second cup I want to show you this morning is is what I call the cup of salvation. Psalm six Psalms one sixteen, verse thirteen. Psalm one sixteen, verse thirteen. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. How do you do that in the church age? How do you do that in 2023? Well, somebody hears the gospel. The gospel is taught. The gospel is preached. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And let's look at verses 12 through 14 that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, 
the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Um, That's right out of the book of Romans. Look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So the second cup is the cup of salvation. The third cup that we're talking about today and all these cups have to do with the cup of God. This third cup that we're going to talk about today is the cup of communion. Mark chapter 14, verses 23 and 24. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. And then Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 25 through 28. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. And then Paul gives a warning. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So the first three cups that I gave you today, these are all cups for a Christian. The cup of obedience, the cup of salvation, the cup of communion at the Lord's Supper, And this is what we are given as Christians. We're called to get saved. We're called to obey. We're called to serve. And we're called to remember his sacrifice until he comes and gets us. But in opposition to this cup, there's another cup. And we're calling this the cup of devils. In 2020... Anheuser-Busch spent $1.1 billion on global ads and $1.7 billion in 2021. The alcohol industry will further expand their digital advertising, um, fueling a 9.2% annual growth through 2023. Did you know that Annual alcohol sales are just under $1 trillion. Now, have you ever been to a baseball game, basketball game, football game, soccer game? These are things that we predominantly associate with families, parents and kids going to the ball game. Have you ever asked yourself why? The number one form of advertising at every ball game is alcohol. Because this is the cup of devils. The first mention of any type of a cup is found in Genesis chapter 40, verse 11. Turn to Genesis chapter 40 for a minute. And the very first time that the word cup is mentioned in the Bible It's in the context, Joseph, who is the type of Christ, has been jailed and he is talking with the chief butler and the chief butler had this dream and he had no idea what it meant. And so he asked Joseph to interpret this dream for him. And in Genesis chapter 40, verses 9 through 11, we see, and the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me. And in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth 
ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Now, turn to... Let me see. um, Where is that verse that we... Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. God has a cup. The world has a cup. God has grapes. God has new wine. The world has grapes. The world has old wine. God has a rock, and that rock is Jesus Christ. The world has a rock, and that's the Roman Catholic Church. Deuteronomy 32, verses 31 through 34. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their wine, their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are the grapes of Gaul. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? And then Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 21, Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the tables of devils. Uh, Joshua, is it Joshua oh, 24, 15? Um, oh, what is that verse? Joshua 24. As for me and my house, we will serve. The, choose you this day whom ye shall serve. Where's that verse? Here it is. Joshua uh, 24, 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye shall dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Um, We've set the table. I have a short message today. Which cup are you drinking from? Are you drinking from the cup of God? Or are you drinking from the cup of devils? As you can see, there is a very distinct difference between the cup of God and And the cup of the world. And many, many times I see Christians who they they are lost and they are confused and they are doubting their salvation. And then I speak with them. I spend time with them. And nine and a half out of ten times what I find is that um, when a Christian has backslidden and has begun to drink once again from the cup of the world, the first thing that happens is you get spiritually confused. The second thing that begins to take place is you begin to doubt your salvation. Have I ever doubted my salvation? Absolutely. Have I ever doubted my salvation when I wasn't backslidden? Absolutely not. And if you want assurance of your salvation, you have to make sure that you are drinking from the right cup. Because if you're drinking from the cup of the world, can you imagine? I want you to think about this for a second. Anheuser-Busch spent $1.7 billion on advertising in 2021. Can you imagine spending $1.7 billion on a free Bible program? Can you imagine what $1.7 billion could do for the work of God? Now, sometimes, it doesn't happen all that often, but sometimes um, God will allow Christians who are working to get something done for him He will allow that type of money to come in. And when that happens, you have a ministry like D.L. Moody. Millions and millions and millions of dollars pass through the hands of D.L. Moody. And you know what he did with it? He built churches. He built schools. 
And for over a quarter of a century, he preached the gospel to a hundred million people with his tent meetings. And um, uh, back in the early 1870s, God put on his heart to start a songbook. And so Moody took some of his money and he, he took these great songs, these great old songs. Um, well, they weren't old when he took them. They were brand new. And they were songs by Iris Sankey and P.P. P. Bliss and um, uh, Fanny Clark and uh, just all these great, what we call the old hymns of the faith. And he put them in a songbook. And uh, they began to sell that songbook for 35 cents a piece. I have one of those books right here with me in the studio right now. And it's amazing when you look at this songbook and you think to yourself, well, 35 cents, that's not much. Well, if you go back to 1877, 35 cents was a lot. You could go to a restaurant and, and get an entire meal for 35 cents. And uh, they sold these songbooks at every single meeting that they had. And hundreds of thousands, millions of people came and they bought these songbooks for 35 cents a piece. So one day, one day, um, they came to Mr. Moody and they said to him, Mr. Moody, we have a problem. He says, what's the problem? Um, they said, uh, well, we've been selling the songbooks and they've been selling really, really well. But we have a little bit of a surplus right now. And Moody said to them, uh, well, how much of a surplus do you have? And they said, we have $236,000. Now, let me just show you how much $236,000 was um, in 1877. Um, $236,000 in 1877 would be equal to right around a million dollars today in 2023. So, they came to Moody and they said to him, we have a little bit of a surplus. And Moody said to them without even flinching, what would you do with that surplus? What would Kenneth Copeland do with that surplus? What would Joel Osteen do with that surplus? I don't know, but I know what Moody said. Moody said to them, great, give it away to charity. And they said to him, but Mr. Moody, you paid for those songbooks with your own money. That money belongs to you. And Mr. Moody replied, I don't have any money. Everything I have comes from God. Give it away. And they pleaded with him a third time. Mr. Moody, that is so much money. And finally, Moody relented. And you know what he did with that money? He said, pay every bill that we have. Pay off the, the, the school, the church, whatever we owe to anybody. Pay, take that money and pay every single bill that we have. And if there's anything left over, then give it away. And finally, his board was satisfied with that answer. And they paid their bills and they gave the rest away to charity. Why would Moody say that? Why would Moody do that? Because Moody drank from the cup of the Lord on a daily basis. He was not confused. He, he didn't have to go to the Lord in prayer to know what to do with that money. And he did the right thing with that money. Because Moody drank from the cup of the Lord. But when you drink from the cup of the world, when you drink, and I'm talking about Christians now. Because unsaved people don't drink from the cup of the Lord anyway. I'm talking about saved people 
who are drinking from the wrong cup. And you know who you are. When I was backslidden, I knew who I was. And if I was to hear a message like this, I would absolutely know that that message was talking to me. And shamefully, there have been times in my life, in my Christian walk, where I have been that person. And one of the things that we have always said about the ministry of Now the End Begins, we keep it real. This is not, you know, this is not some seminary. This is not, we are not trying to curry favor with man. We're not trying to impress anybody here. Um, this ministry is just one beggar telling another beggar where the bread is. That's what we're concerned with at this ministry. We're concerned about getting something done for the Lord Jesus Christ while we are able to do it. And you know what the great thing is about realizing that you're drinking from the wrong cup? And I'm talking today to people who are probably, there has to be some people listening to this message right now who are born again, saved, headed for heaven, but they're drinking from the wrong cup today. And I'm going to tell you something. One of the really good things about understanding that you're drinking from the wrong cup is that you have time to fix it and you have time to change it. And there was a moment in my life years ago, about five years ago, uh, where God got a hold of me and he grabbed me by the throat and he shook me into my senses. And I realized that I was drinking from the wrong cup and I dropped that cup and I haven't picked it up. And I don't want to pick it up. And whatever you're struggling with today, if you have that wrong cup, don't beat yourself up over it. It's not about a guilt trip. It's not about feeling bad. It's about dropping the wrong cup and picking up the right cup and getting back to your first love. You know, the Bible says this. If you find yourself drinking from the wrong cup, the Apostle Paul says that this is what you have to do. And it's not hard. You just have to want to do it. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 25 and 26, Paul says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, talking about saved people who are drinking from the wrong cup, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the, acknowledge, to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Paul says that if you are drinking from the wrong cup today, you need to recover yourself. You have the Holy Spirit. You've been sealed unto the day of redemption. You know that you're drinking from the wrong cup. Look at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Repentance is not being sorry for your sins. It's changing your mind about them. If you're drinking from the wrong cup, you don't have to be sorry for it. You have to drop it. That's what repentance is. And if you have the wrong cup today, um, you need to drop that cup. Now, what does it look like when you drop the cup of the world? Well, you got to prayerfully consider about, should I go to church on the Sunday or should I go tailgating with my friends to the football game? Can you do both? Well, you can. 
But Paul says you can't be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils, meaning you have to make a choice. Am I saying that going to sporting events is of the devil? No, absolutely not. I am not saying that. But if you're going to a sporting event instead of fellowshipping with the brethren and worshiping the Lord, well, that may not be um, the best choice that you could possibly make. So we've looked at the cup of God and we've looked at the cup of devils. There's one more cup I want to show you today. Um, this is the cup of God's wrath. Turn to Revelation chapter 14, verse 10, talking about the people that take the mark of the beast. Revelation 14, 10 says, They shall drink, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The Bible says that during the time of the great tribulation, God pours out his wrath and he does not dilute it. He does not buffer it. This morning, I had a little bit of a headache. So I reached for my bottle of bare buffered aspirin. And it was buffered with a coating to be gentle on my stomach. The Bible says that when God pours out his wrath, he is not going to buffer it. He is not going to mix it. He's not going to water it down. And the people in that day are going to drink of the cup of the wine of the wrath of God. In Revelation chapter 16, verse 29 and the great city was divided into th three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. The Bible says that Jesus, um, he's in that time, he's going to go into the wine press of God. And he's going to tread this wine press. Revelation 19.15 And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he should rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the wine press of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Christian, God has a cup for you today. It's the cup of obedience. And in that cup you're going to find new wine. It is new wine taken from the clusters of God's grape. And it's not going to have any alcohol in that cluster. It, there's, it's going to go straight from the vine into your cup. It's going to be crushed. Have you ever read any papers on the healing properties of red wine um, that's not fermented? We call that grape juice. New wine. And um, it lowers your blood pressure. It increases your circulation. It helps your heart to be stronger. You know what alcoholic wine does for you? It raises your blood pressure. It helps your heart to be weaker. It lowers your circulation. It temporarily raises it. And that's that feeling of euphoria that you feel. But consuming alcohol over many years has the opposite effect and it lowers your circulation and it hardens your heart and it raises your blood pressure. You know what Jesus said back in Mark chapter 10 where we started with this message this morning? But Jesus said unto them, ye know not what ye ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of? And be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. And they said unto him, we can. No problem, Lord. It's going to cost you your life, Peter. John 21. It's going to cost you your life, James. Acts chapter 12. Hey, Paul. You're going to get your head cut off. Second Timothy chapter 4. Can you drink of the cup that I can drink of? Yeah, Lord, sure. No problem. Christian, I, 
I urge you today, the, the meat of my message today is drinking at the cup of the Lord. And I don't know where that will take you in your individual life. God has a different plan for everybody. But this is where it took the Apostle Paul at the end of his life. 2 Timothy 4, 6, For I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I'm ready to go to the chopping block. Paul says, I'm ready because I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And if I was going to add to the Bible, I might write, and I have drank of the cup of the Lord. And Paul says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? What did it cost the apostles? It cost them everything. What did it cost the people who um, gave their lives that we could have a Bible printed in English? It cost them everything. They were burned at the stake. They were sawn asunder and torn in two, as Hebrews chapter 11 talks about. We don't have time to go into that, but read that sometime. Every single person in what we call the heroes of the faith, they all drank from the right cup and they rejected the wrong cup. Christian, my prayer for you today, if you're drinking from the wrong cup and, and you know who you are and you know what that cup is, but if you're drinking from the wrong cup today, why don't you drop it? Why don't you get down on your knees and pray, Lord, forgive me and give me that right cup again and take that cup of obedience and recover yourselves from the snare of the devil. And again, I'm not talking to lost people. I'm talking to saved people. But if you're lost today, God has a cup for you and that cup is filled with his blood. I get mad when I hear preachers like John MacArthur saying that the blood was no big deal. John MacArthur says that the blood that was shed is not God's blood. It was the blood of man. Well, this is what the Bible says in, in Acts chapter 20, verses 27 and 28, and then I'll be done for today. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and unto all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. That's not the blood of man. If you know anything about the English language, Paul is talking about God. He is talking about God the Father. He is talking about God the Father shedding His blood on the cross. And you might say to me, wait a minute. I thought Jesus was on the cross. He was. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus is the manifest image of God. And that blood that was shed that day on the cross at Calvary, if you're lost today, that blood was shed for you. And that cup that God offers you today is a cup that is filled with blood. The blood that God shed for you. And if you'll take that cup and if you'll drink that cup today, no, I'm not talking about going to a Roman Catholic church and drinking wine. I'm talking about the cup of salvation. If you remember, that was the second cup that we talked about today. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. And if you'll call upon the name of the Lord today, the Apostle Paul says, you shall be saved. And that cup that you'll drink of to get saved, 
was made possible through the shed blood of Jesus Christ that made the payment for you at Calvary. Christian, there's two cups. There's the cup of God and there's the cup of the world that the Bible calls the cup of devils. Which one will you drink from today? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and for your mercy. We thank you, Father God, for all these that you've gathered here today. And Lord, I just pray that as you continue to give revival here at Now the End Begins, as you continue to uh, work and move and put on people's hearts to get on fire for you, and we see it. So many people handing out tracts. Uh, Trisha is witnessing to police officers on her job, and Charlton is on a bicycle with gospel signs, and Kyle and Reagan are on a street corner in Baton Rouge, and Jill is handing out Bibles where she lives, and now her niece is on the verge of getting saved. And so many uh, people here, Father God, many of whom when they got here were drinking from the cup of the world, have dropped that cup and they have taken your cup, Father God. And uh, Lord, we just thank you and we praise you and uh, continue to work and move in our midst that we would get something done for you that will bear fruit for all eternity. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And will you look at that? I got through the entire sermon without one single cough. And I praise the Lord for that. I hope this message was a blessing to you. Um, for me, it was a great reminder. It was a great reminder of... Um, where I was when the Lord found me and uh, where he's brought me through and to. And um, don't be discouraged. If you're struggling with something today, keep struggling. If you're battling alcohol and drugs and addiction, don't give up. Keep battling. Keep pressing. Keep pushing through. And um, the Bible says that my God can do all things. He can do all things with, with God. All things are possible. Thank you for tuning in today. And Lord willing, we're going to see you back here tomorrow, noon Eastern time for another Prophecy News podcast. Have a great rest of your Sunday, everybody. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from
sins away. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die.